Good afternoon. My name is John Herbst and I run the Eurasia Center here at the Atlantic Council. We have a wonderful program for you today on the upcoming visit of the President of Uzbekistan, Mirziyoyev, here to Washington, but also on the changes that we're seeing in Central Asia and particularly in Uzbekistan. We have um, an excellent group of people to talk to you. Uh, you have their bio, so I'm not going to read their bio to you. We'll get right into the conversation. Um, I will start by asking our Uzbek friends for their comments on the whole range of issues facing them with a look toward the, both in terms of the region and in terms of the visit. And then we have commentary from Dr. Leader Kurt Lisa Curtis, Senior Director at the NSC for South and Central Asia, and then the Dean of all Central Asian commentators who's not from Central Asia, Fred Starr. And with that, I'd like to start with Senator Safaev, former Foreign Minister Safaev, former Ambassador to Washington Safaev, and an old friend of mine going back now 18 years, I'm amazing to say. So, Senator, we've seen interesting changes in Tashkent over the past 20 months. Your comments on what's happening and what we can expect. Thank you, John. Thank you for your kind introduction, and I'm also happy to be back. Atlantic Council and to see so many familiar faces and to welcome new friends here. And thank you very much for your interest to come and to see us today. We indeed in the eve of a very important event, historic trip of President Mirziyoyev to Washington. Why it's historic? To my mind, first of all, it was initiated by American partners to invite leader of Uzbekistan and to encourage uh, president on his brave and courageous reforms uh, unfolding in Uzbekistan. Secondly, I think today, after the 20, uh, 20 months of his leadership, due to the new proactive foreign policy, we have a completely new regional situation in Central Asia, with some projection to Afghanistan, which is also very important, and I think that taking into account that Afghanistan is an agenda of world uh, community, uh, it will be one of the part of our dialogue. And third, the reforms going on in Uzbekistan have created completely new investment climate, and we've seen growing interest of American business to be in Uzbekistan and to act in Uzbekistan. Uh, today it was announced in Uzbekistan, and I hope that it will be confirmed tomorrow during the signing ceremony that more than 8 billion US dollar contracts and agreements will be signed between two sides. Great achievement. I think it happened because new situation in Uzbekistan and uh, reforming process. If you will ask me to define in two words what's going on in Uzbekistan, I would say political modernization, genuine modernization. And uh, it includes wide range of the steps and starts not according to the old Marxistic view from the economic modernization, but economic modernization should follow the changing political matrix, changing the uh, system of governance, applying of the principles of good governance, uh, transparent, accountable, uh, and uh, eradicating corruption, judicial reforms, and understanding that any kind of genuine reforms normally is not uh, associated only with the good things, but it might bring some hardship proactive social policy which will prevent that discreditation of reforms and the worsening of the situation for some segments of Uzbek society. And of course, new foreign policy. And we're here today to tell you about the one by one of all these pillars of the new reforms. And in regard with the good governance, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, it's initially the basics of all reforms. And uh, the more openness, accountability, and completely new role of the media and civil 
society is what we have now in Uzbekistan. Frankly, it was unexpected to me. Uh, so in such a short time, we might have such a new environment, new spirit in, in the country. You might ask, what's behind of this aspiration? Whether it's a genuine, not imitation of reforms, whether it will be irreversible character, have an irreversible character. I think we hope. We hope so. First of all, because there is no other way to address the challenges which Uzbekistan faces, such as in a political Islam, international terrorism, need to create the job or growing number of the population, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There is only way to uh, to guarantee sustainable development. This is more democracy, more open economy, and more open society. Second, basics for believing that it's not in a, it will have an irreversible character, that. It's young society, with the people believing and wanting more freedom, more opportunity. This morning, I, we had a meeting in the National Press Club, and I gave one example, which was, I would like just to share with you and conclude my introduction. I'm, I have a course in Westminster University in Uzbekistan, which Professor Starr many times visited, and my students enjoyed his wonderful lessons. During one of the uh, last meetings there, I put a question in front of my students. How do you see the future of Uzbekistan? What's the options of further development, let's say, in the next 20, 25 years? And I gave them four options. Democracy, socialism, Islamism, autarky or nationalism. More than 100 students, after the live debate, overwhelmingly said democracy is the only option to develop, to, to, for development. And even the girls with the Islamic scarves in audience, they also voted for that. And I think that this is a choice of Uzbekistan. And government inevitably should take to the account the demand of its constituency, while the 70% of the population is younger than 30 years old, and it's their choice. Thank you very much. I'd like to co conclude my initial remarks, and I will be open to your question. Thank you. Thank you for your, for your remarks. <laughs> Mr. Saeedov, you, you have responsibility for a portfolio which, especially in the West, is considered very important, which is human rights. We've seen some interesting developments over the past 17, 18 months. Oops, yes, yes, sorry about that. Uh, we've seen some interesting developments over the past uh, 15, 16 months. Uh, even very recently, we've release of um, IRC activists. Uh, how do you see developments in this area going forward? Thank you. Excellency, uh, ladies and gentlemen, yes, uh, it's my great honor to speak uh, to this distinction. I'm happy to see many of similar faces and old friends as ambassador here. Uh, as the French says, Ronon en mouton. Ambassador Senator uh, Safai said about the new situation in Uzbekistan. And I want to say a few words in two human rights situation in Uzbekistan and the, uh, the recent parliamentary reforms in Uzbekistan. First of all, uh, I want to say about the discussion, about the consideration of uh, the third national report of Uzbekistan on a universal periodic review in Geneva in the session of Human Rights Council. Our report was presented in uh, 9th of May this year in Geneva. And I want to say uh, it's a very constructive, uh, constructive discussion during the consideration of our report. And many, uh, there are 77 representatives of states uh, discussed it and participated during the discussion of our report, and 212 recommendations done with for us. And Uzbek delegation was adopted 
201 recommendations. And each recommendation is very useful for us, available uh, remarks about the human rights situation. Uh, Ambassador, you uh, fully uh, right. Uh, many, many uh, delegations said uh, for uh, his satisfaction uh, on uh, release several uh, prisoners. Uh, in 2014, we received from the European Union the list uh, his consists 34 prisoners, families. And uh, today, uh, uh, 32 prisoners released. The last is uh, in his life. After the, after the negotiations with the uh, cotton campaign, this cotton campaign uh, today is in, uh, in, in Tashkent, and he has very, very negotiations with the Uzbek officials and representatives of the civil society. And uh, it, this is good. And um, we want uh, it's very close to work with our international and national partners. Uh, we have a good uh, experience. Uh, adopted the uh, road maps by the Uzbek Parliament. You know, uh, last year in the first time Uzbekistan was invited High Commissioner of UN for Human Rights, and after the 15 years, we uh, invited Special Rapporteur UN on uh, Religious uh, Beliefs uh, or Religious Liberty, Mr. Uh, and at the uh, at the end of May, we adopted. Have uh, adopted a roadmap for implementing the recommendations of High Commissioner for Human Rights. For, for, uh, so, uh, excuse me, uh, Special Rapporteur Ahmed Shahid. And you may we disseminated all of the publications in this uh, room. And uh, the second, the growth of the role of Parliament in the human rights issue. In the first time, the Parliament, the both chamber of. Ali Majlis, uh, the Legislative Chamber and uh, Senate was adopted in the first time parliamentary report on the situation of human rights in Uzbekistan. And this book also disseminated here. This book, this uh, roadmap, roadmap concerning implementation of recommendations, special report. Uh, 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 we have a, a unique experience in this, in this field. And I think uh, we proclaim it about the invitation, the new special rapporteur UN on uh, independence of judiciary. And we want step by step invited uh, another special rapporteurs in the next day that we will be, we will be very actively um, cooperating with our international partners, including uh, human rights institutions of United Nations, other regional, regional organizations. And uh, we have this good opportunity to uh, cooperate with the American partner. And we'll be good. this is the first question I want to stress it about the human rights situation uh, in Uzbekistan. And the second, uh, parliamentary reform. Uh, one of the pillars of strategy of action uh, on the five priorities of the of Uzbekistan is uh, with the growing the role of Uzbek parliament. I want, in my short remarks, I'd like to indicate four new trends uh, in the acute of Uzbekistan. The first, uh, the parliament of Uzbekistan, uh, as in other national parliaments in the world, carries out legislative activity. But the new tradition in a lawmaking process of Uzbek parliament is considering wider public opinion and implementing the mechanism of public debates about uh, debates, the internet, and social networks. For example, above mentioned strategy of action was adopted after the public hearings, public uh, discussion. And uh, we, um, last week, the uh, legislative chamber uh, of our parliament adopted the law on countering extremism on the first reading and presented uh, it to nationwide discussion. In this regard, uh, expertise of our American uh, friends would be highly valuable for us to improve this draft bill. The second, Parliament uh, faces many difficulties in introduction of the principle of parliamentary oversight. Our ministers are not used to reporting to the Parliament, but all levels of executive branch must do it nowadays. 
We are breaking the old mindset and start back. Nevertheless, we implemented the following tips of parliamentary oversight. Parliamentary hearings, the budget control, uh, government hour, and deputy inquiry. The experience gained by the United States Congress is very attractive for us to learn and introduce it in our parliamentary activity. The said security. In April of this year, Uzbek Parliament adopted the report on human rights in Uzbekistan for the first time. I mentioned and this report, parliamentary report of Uzbekistan, we, we disseminated among the, uh, our participants. Besides, uh, I said about the visit of uh, High Commissioner, about the invitation special reporter, and we will continue uh, this work further. One, uh, it's more important. Our par parliament not only ratified the international instruments on human rights. Today, the Uzbek parliament was ratified more than 70 international documents on human rights. Among these, 10 uh, international instruments of United Nations. And we are very close with the treaty bodies of United Nations. And this peculiarity uh, consists so with the parliament, uh, with the parliament also implementation of the uh, 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 Uzbek Parliament carries out implementation control of our international obligations in this sphere. And the last fourth, we established two parliamentary commissions. One of these parliamentary commission on supporting non-governmental organizations, independent uh, mass media, and uh, uh, civil society institutions. During the last years, uh, this uh, commission uh, carries out, uh, this commission uh, will allocate 17 billion Uzbek sums for civil society institutions. Uh, we may compare to 2 billion in uh, 2008. And the last, we sent to establish the second parliamentary commission. This commission concerning to protect constitutional labor rights of citizens. You know, uh, we have problem concerning ch uh, child and forced labor. And this commission will agree to pay great attention concerning elimination of all forms of child labor and, and, and forced labor. This is a, a new brief I once said, and at the, uh, at the uh, end of my uh, speech, I once said, uh, the great uh, writer, uh, German great writer Goethe said, the solving each problem, uh, the, uh, the solving each problem is new problem. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Hurt. If you allow me, dear ladies and gentlemen, I will speak in Russian. My colleague will help. Я хотел бы сказать, что э, с первых э, дней на посту президента Узбекистана господин э, президент Шавкат Мирамович Мирзеев стал определил приоритеты внешней политики нашей республики. Это выстраивание конструктивных отношений с нашими соседями в регионе. И, конечно же, Афганистан стал занимать очень важное место в внешней политической стратегии Узбекистана. Наш президент... From the first uh, days um, since Mr. Mirziyev has become a president, he has defined that the priority of the foreign policy of Uzbekistan should become the cooperation, constructive relations with the neighboring countries. And of course, to this end, Afghanistan has become an important uh, part of this uh, foreign policy domain. Our president, in other words, proposed to look at Afghanistan not as a threat, а как на возможность выстраивать нормальные добрососедские отношения и через эту призму содействовать, создавать необходимые условия для 
установления мира в этой стране. And uh, in, in, in order to, uh, in, this, in this extent, uh, the president has uh, proposed to look at Afghanistan not as a threat or challenge, but as an opportunity and uh, to have a chance to enhance and to develop good and uh, constructive relations with this country, to assist this country and to promote and facilitate peace and stability in that country. Была выработана абсолютно новая стратегия в развитии отношений с Афганистаном, которая предусматривала расширение наших отношений с этой страной во всех сферах. So basically we have new strategy in our cooperation with Afghanistan, which extends to absolutely new type of relations and the scope of the relations with that country. И uh, как uh, результат uh, вот этой новой uh, стратегии в отношении Афганистана, само по себе жизнь подсказала, что uh, нужно uh, изменять наши отношения, наши подходы к афганской проблеме. И мы стали активно поддерживать все международные инициативы, uh, все международные uh, усилия по uh, разрешению афганского конфликта. And Indeed, uh, as a result of this new strategy, the life itself has proved that it's necessary for us, it was necessary for us to change our approaches vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan. And we have changed our approach and we started to be actively involved in the international process on Afghanistan and to support various international initiatives on that country. И самое главное в этом в этой своей политике мы стали придерживаться основного принципа в отношении Афганистана. Это то, что сами афганцы должны играть ключевую роль в разрешении этого конфликта, то есть принцип Афган Оун, Афган Лет. And uh, indeed, this policy uh, is also based on a very important principle, which we are strongly advocating. This is uh, the peace process and reconciliation process in Afghanistan should be Afghan led and Afghan owned. И с этой точки зрения мы полностью поддерживаем uh, Кабульский процесс организованные правительством Афганистана. И мы увидели очень большое, большое эволюционное изменение даже в подходах самого Кабула после выступления президента Ашафа Гани на втором заседании Кабульского процесса в этом году. And we do support the Kabul process initiated, brought forward by Afghan government. And indeed, we also see the changes within the approaches of uh, Kabul uh, towards different developments in uh, Afghanistan, which could be demonstrated by the speech of uh, Mr. Ashraf Ghani at the second uh, round or second session of this Kabul process. И мы не должны забывать, что именно президент Ашраф Ghani предложил начать мирные политические переговоры с вооруженной оппозицией, прежде всего движением Талибан. And we have to keep in mind, or bear in mind, that uh, the President Ghani uh, has proposed to launch a peaceful political negotiations with the military opposition, including uh, uh, Taliban. И uh, вот как бы логическим продолжением Кабульского процесса явилась Ташкентская конференция, мирная конференция по Афганистану, которая состоялась в конце марта этого года. And uh, logic continuation of this Kabul process, uh, we could um, brought forward a Tashkent conference on Afghanistan, which uh, Uzbekistan finally hosted end of March this year. И главным результатом uh, этой Ташкентской конференции стало то, что на региональном и на глобальном uh, уровне uh, было заявлено, что военного пути решения этой проблемы нет. И только мирный политический процесс может принести мир, долгожданный мир и стабильность в Афганистан. And the main result of this uh, on regional and global level uh, is the common understanding that there is no military solution for Afghan uh, problem. Only a peaceful political process could bring peace, stability and prosperity to that country. И все uh, страны, а их было более 20 uh, стран, uh, и самые основные международные организации, как Организация Объединенных, нации, страны Шанхайской организации сотрудничества. И надо сказать, что впервые вот в таком формате была проведена международная конференция по Афганистану, где собрались соединенные представители Соединенных Штатов, России, Китая, региональные важные страны, как Индия, Иран, Пакистан, Турция, 
основные страны Европейского Союза и, естественно, все страны Центральной Азии. And indeed, uh, this event was a very um, extraordinary occasional event. It had never happened um, in the region before, and uh, it gathered more than 20 participants, including the international institutions as United Nations, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and others, as well as uh, different countries, including the United States, Russia, China, and regional uh, players like India, Iran, Pakistan, Turkey, uh, as well as the European Union with its member states have attended this event. And obviously, it's very important to underline that the Central Asian countries were actively involved in this conference. И все участники Ташкентской конференции призвали вооруженную оппозицию движения Талибан сесть за стол переговоров с правительством Кабула и начать переговорный процесс. And all participants has unanimously called the military opposition to uh, sit on the table of negotiations with Kabul and start um, the talks on peaceful uh, ways of reconciliation. Я не буду много занимать вашего времени, но я скажу, что при выходе вы можете взять эту книгу. Здесь собраны все материалы Ташкентской мирной конференции по Афганистану. Well, I'm not going to take uh, much of your time, but I just want to tell you that when you going to go out from this hall, you over there you can find a book which uh, compiles all uh, materials and all addresses made at this Tashkent conference on Afghanistan. Uh, здесь собраны uh, все выступления uh, на этой Ташкентской конференции, и uh, выступление uh, книга uh, начинается с выступления президента Узбекистана Шавката Мирамонча Мирзияева и президента Афганистана господина Ашафа Гани, по инициативе которых был создан Ташкентский форум. This book uh, includes all uh, speeches and uh, uh, it starts with the speech of the president of Uzbekistan, Mr. Mirziyayev, and uh, the president of Afghanistan, Mr. Ghani. Uh, uh, on an initiative of these two people, this conference itself had been held in Uzbekistan. Мы благодарны всем нашим партнерам, всем нашим друзьям, которые поддержали эту нашу Ташкентскую конференцию и приняли самое активное участие в ней. We uh, would like to express our sincere uh, appreciation to all these participants who have uh, attended this conference and supported the initiatives of Uzbekistan uh, brought forward within that event. Кроме этого, я должен сказать, что мы очень активно развиваем торгово-экономические отношения с Афганистаном, и за последний год мы довели двусторонний товарооборот более на 600 миллионов долларов. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'd like also to draw your attention that the trade is with Afghanistan is um, is growing very um, very hastily and speedily. And over the last year, we have um, enhanced or increased our bilateral trade to 600 million dollars. Мы предоставили Афганистану очень много преференций в торговле, в транзите грузов, и создаем все необходимые условия для того, чтобы Афганистан мог не только с нами торговать, но и со всем миром торговать. We, uh, create, we, we provide a lot of trade preferences to Afghanistan, as well as the various uh, preferences in transiting of goods. So uh, we would like Afghanistan to see Afghanistan not only trading with us, but with the rest of the world as well. Мы начали осуществлять очень крупные транспортно-логистические проекты в Афганистане, такие как строительство железной дороги от Мазари Шарифа до Герата и линию электропередачи с Сурхана до Пулихумри. Сурхана Пулихумри. Mm -hmm. So are we also um, implementing large infrastructure projects uh, and transport logistic yeah. projects in Afghanistan. We are uh, starting um, the construction of railroad from Mazari Sharif to Herat, as, a, as, a, as well as the power, power line from uh, Surhan to Kulikumi. Господин Хёрс мне показывает, что мне нужно заканчивать. Я думаю, я смогу ответить на ваши вопросы, но в конце я хотел бы сказать, что мы очень надеемся что тот э, мирный политический процесс, ради которого э, международное сообщество э, создает все необходимые условия, э, он возобновится, и Узбекистан э, не только ограничится проведением этой ми мирной конференции по Афганистану, но мы сможем стать частью этого политического процесса э, по установлению мира в Афганистане.
Uh, Mr. Herbs is signaling me uh, that I am running, running out of time, but, and therefore, in the very end, I would like to underline that we hope that this peace process in Afghanistan, which international community is looking, is very much seeking for, uh, will be resumed. And we very much hope that Uzbekistan, not because of this conference, but uh, because of its efforts as a whole, will be a part of this process and will facilitate it as much as we can. Thank you. Thank you. It's a reminder of how many important subjects we have here this afternoon. Mr. Oripov, the role of other large powers in the region, China and Russia, is very important, and for that matter, the United States. Your views, please. Yes, thank you, Ambassador Herbst. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's a great pleasure to be part of this distinguished panel. Uh, and uh, previous speakers already mentioned internal reforms in Uzbekistan, and Mr. Gashev described our policy toward Afghanistan. But I think that uh, the picture of Uzbekistan's new face would not be complete without mentioning our new policy toward Central Asia. Uh, Ambassador Gashev already mentioned that uh, President Mirziyev identified Central Asia as a key priority of its uh, foreign policy. And it was not just, you know, empty slogan. It was really well considered, very pragmatic choice. As you know, Uzbekistan um, uh, is the only country in Central Asia which has the borders with all countries of the region and Afghanistan. And actually, all, all vital issues like transport, transit, uh, energy and water use, security, they all depend on the situation in the region. Unfortunately, in the past, the problems existed among Central Asian countries. They have not been resolved, they only accumulated. Actually, the level of trust among Central Asian countries was quite low, to be frank. Um, uh, conflict potential in the border areas used to be very high. Uh, people who lived in the border areas especially were not able to visit their relatives, their friends, because of the closed uh, checkpoints. Uh, so, and um, because of the undertaken measures uh, right now, because of the Uzbekistan active foreign policy, we really achieved tremendous breakthrough in the region. Uh, situation in Central Asia today is fundamentally different than it was just one year and a half ago. Today we have absolutely new political atmosphere in the region. And I would like to give you just uh, some examples of this, uh, of, of this breakthrough. Uh, first of all, I have to mention crucial agreements which were signed between Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan on delimitation and demarcation of the borders. Because absence of these agreements really provoked tensions between countries of the region. And I will give you just one figure. Uh, during 2015, 2016, there were at least 15 incidents on the Kyrgyz-Uzbek border. Right now, this number practically reduced to zero. These agreements also facilitated contacts between people um, dozens of checkpoints were closed right now. We signed uh, an agreement with Tajikistan, according to which citizens of Tajikistan could now, now visit Uzbekistan for 30 days without visas. So uh, we're not only improved by these uh, relations, bilateral relations, we really uh, contributed to the regional security because we eliminated the sources of instability in the region. Uh, we also made in progress in uh, resolving this, uh, disputes on water issues. You know, Uzbekistan clearly uh, stated that he's ready to, take, to consider the uh, uh, possibility to take part in the construction of hydropower plants in uh, Tajikistan and uh, Kyrgyzstan. Um, the third, I believe, very important one, um, this new policy of Uzbekistan really boosted regional trade and economic relations. The trade to Nova between Uzbekistan and Central Asia increased uh, in 2017 by 20% uh, and reached $3 billion, with, uh, with some countries 70%. And we are now uh, hope that uh, in, in coming year we will reach uh, figure of $5 billion. And um, Uzbekistan right now developing also uh, new forms of uh, industrial cooperation in, in Central Asia. For example, Uzbekistan um, reached an agreement with Kazakhstan. Now we will produce Uzbek cars on Kazakh territory. 
who produce Uzbek buses in Kyrgyzstan. So it's quite, it's quite new tendencies right now happening in, in Central Asia. And at the initiative of the president of Uzbekistan, we are going to establish a regional economic forum in the region. Uh, this forum will gather all business people around Central Asia, and they will have a chance to talk with each other <coughs> to, to develop regional projects, economic projects in the region. So uh, I think it will give a new impetus uh, to economic relations within the country. We intensified our cooperation in transport sphere. Uh, I have to say that uh, with Uzbekistan, we reached with uh, Kazakhstan, we reached an agreement to organize high-speed uh, railway service. Uh, for the first uh, time in 25 years, we opened a link with uh, Dushanbe, Tashkent Dushanbe, and um, also very important one, after the visit of our president to Turkmenistan, a uh, very important section of transport corridor which connects Uzbekistan with Turkmenistan, Iran and Amman was, uh, was launched. Uh, uh, the railroad of Turkmenabad, Farab, and uh, river bridges across Amudarya were opened. By the way, this helped to increase the volume of cargo transportation by two and a half uh, times. Um, and last but not least, we solved not only specific problems in the region, we also changed the logic of regional cooperation. Because today we really uh, stop talking about our differences. We stop dividing our history. We are now talking about our common roots, about our common regional interests, and this is very important. And a vivid example of this new logic was, of course, a conference in Samarkand, which took place in November of the last year. It gathered uh, representatives from 20 countries from Europe, America, uh, Asia, uh, I believe uh, our American panelists uh, here, Ambassador Herbs, Professor Stahl, Lisa Curtis, they all participated in the conference. And um, at the end, as a, the main outcome of this conference was, of course, adoption of a special communique, uh, which um, really favored the deepening of regional uh, cooperation in Central Asia. And it also reflected very important initiative of the president of Uzbekistan, it's the uh, establishment of a, uh, regular consultative meetings of the heads of the states of Central Asia. And in March uh, uh, of this year, for the first time in the last decade, uh, all leaders of Central Asian countries gathered in Astana. And we believe that uh, the next forum uh, will be held in Tashkent um, and during the Navruz uh, celebration. And for the first time uh, in the decade, leaders of Central Asia had a possibility just uh, to talk regional problems, uh, develop uh, common regional approaches uh, to them. Um, and actually, I would like to draw your attention again to another book. Uh, it's uh, about Samarkand Conference. You will see here the texts of all participants. Uh, you will see here uh, the text of the uh, communique which was adopted. And at the end, I just would like to say that Uzbekistan really becomes a powerful stabilizing force in Central Asia. And it makes Central Asia really more stable, more uh, predictable, more prosperous. Thank you. All touched on, I think, the major reasons that we see uh, so much focus on Uzbekistan and Central Asia uh, in general from this administration. We've talked about uh, the reforms, some of the economic and human rights reforms that we see President Mirziyoyev instituting. And I think this visit is an opportunity to encourage those reforms and validate those reforms. Uh, we talked about the importance of Central Asia as a region and the role of China and Russia. And that's another important reason. And of course, Afghanistan. Uzbekistan has a very important role to play in Afghanistan and stabilizing that country. And then, of course, uh, the business opportunities that some of President Mirziyoyev's reforms uh, can encourage. Uh, so if I could, I'd like to talk about those areas in the context of the President's national security strategy, which was announced in December. So you can really see how Uzbekistan and the Uzbek-US relationship uh, really supports the core, the four core pillars of that strategy. First uh, would be 
promoting uh, security in the American homeland. Um, and here we can talk about the transnational terrorist and criminal threats uh, that we see in the region and the importance of the cooperation between our countries um, in helping to provide uh, security for America and, of course, our friends uh, from these emerging threats. And as a moderate Muslim country, uh, I think our friends in the region share a common concern with the possible rise of radical jihadist terrorism. Uh, of course, the despicable terrorist attack on October 31st of last year, this is the truck attack in New York City uh, by the Uzbek national, it highlighted the common threat that our countries face. And I think by developing closer uh, security cooperation and ties, we can find and interdict these individuals and groups before they threaten both of our peaceful societies. The second core pillar of the national security strategy, uh, promoting American prosperity. And as I mentioned, as Uzbekistan seeks to diversify and modernize its economy, uh, there will be new opportunities and opening for American businesses. And securing market access to a young and growing regional population of over 30 million with a GDP of nearly 50 billion will certainly lead to uh, new opportunities uh, and more uh, jobs for Americans. Uh, during the course of the visit, as was mentioned, uh, Uzbekistan plans to sign uh, over 20 business deals worth nearly uh, four or five billion uh, with U.S. companies. Uh, so the U.S. government stands ready to work together to further improve the Uzbek business climate uh, in doing this through the building of the protection of intellectual property rights, improvement of rule of law, and an overall increase in transparency and accountability. And of course, our support for Uzbekistan's World Trade Organization accession uh, will further improve this business environment. The third core pillar of the national security strategy, peace, achieving peace through strength. And this is where Uzbekistan's relationship to Afghanistan comes in. Uh, Uzbekistan has played an important role in the Northern Distribution Network, which guarantees alternate U.S. logistical access to Afghanistan. Uzbekistan has also sought to support the President South Asia strategy by sharing more of the burden for peace and stability in Afghanistan. And at the Tashkent conference in March, President Mirziyoyev urged participants to, and I'm quoting here, constructively discuss and develop joint solutions to one of the most acute regional and global problems of our time. And we appreciate that President Mirziyoyev has focused on improving uh, relations with Afghanistan and improving economic connectivity and development in Afghanistan. And finally, the fourth core pillar of the national security strategy, which is to advance American influence. Uh, Uzbekistan has made great progress, uh, but does face continuing challenges in the areas of human rights, labor issues, uh, restrictions on religious freedom, uh, and freedom of the press. Uh, these, of course, are basic freedoms and values uh, that are key to alleviating those social tensions that would otherwise be directed toward extremist ideologies. Now, Uzbekistan has taken great strides uh, in the right direction, and we heard about many, many of those from my colleague here. Uh, they've released many prisoners of conscience. Uh, they've eliminated sy uh, systematic child labor. Uh, we also welcome the Uzbek government's decision to accredit Voice of America. Uh, this is a very important step. And we are looking forward to uh, President Mirziyoyev's commitment to a religious freedom roadmap during this visit, which will lead to substantive steps that address many of the issues that were raised by the UN Special Rapporteur on Religious Freedom. These include lifting restrictions on religious groups registration, on religious literature and the assembly for uh, peaceful assembly of religious groups. So 
So I think President Mirziyoyev's visit represents an opportunity to strengthen a key strategic partnership. And we look forward to launching this new era of partnership with this important meeting that will take place on Wednesday. Thank you. That was wonderful, thank you. Fred, um, you established the Central Asia Caucasus Institute over 20 years ago. You wrote The Definitive Cultural History of Central Asia, which I recommend to everyone. It's an absolutely brilliant book. You have more standing to comment on the changes we've seen than probably anyone in this hemisphere. With that, go at it. Let me ask, are you dizzy? We're talking about an absolute whirlwind of, of initiatives. We're talking about presidential decrees. We're talking about legislative acts by the parliament. We're talking about administrative orders. A mass of activity, a dizzying mass of activity. And if you're confused, don't be surprised. It's confusing. We were so confused by this eight months ago that at the Central Asia Caucasus Institute, we decided that we wanted to to catalog what was going on in every area, all these key areas. And, and uh, we did so. We gathered a group of, of very, very competent international specialists, re people really in the know. And they have, they have produced a book, which I'm pleased to hold up here today, on Uzbekistan's new face. Uh, it, it will be out in a, in, a, in a couple of months. But the fact is, all the major papers in it are online already, and I recommend them to you. Uh, they, cover, they cover everything from economics, law, human rights, governance, religion, foreign relations. And it will, they simply report on what has been done, and it gives you a baseline from which you can follow the progress in the future. Now, let me, let me just very quickly cite a couple of points that struck us in putting this together uh, concerning the, the, this great movement for reform and change in Uzbekistan. Not all of them are obvious. First point that I would stress is it seems terribly sudden that this suddenly out of a clear blue sky appeared. That's not quite the case. The deeper we looked, the more we learned how, how many how much serious thought and planning had been going on for years and years before, before the change of tempo. So it didn't come out of, a, out of a clear blue sky. It has roots. Second, it, whatever complications and problems the Uzbek economy has, and it does, nonetheless, it has undertaken, the Uzbeks have undertaken this from a position of relative strength. This augurs well for the future. It's not being done out of desperation. It's not being done in, in, in the face of, of some impending doom. Third point, of course, the presence of, of, of President Mirziyoyev here is extremely important. He is a very dynamic figure. He served for 13 years as prime minister. He knows the country probably as well as any human being could possibly know it, because he's kick the tire wheels, as we say. Um, however, it's not a solo operation. Something that struck us throughout the research is that this really represents the emergence of a whole new, uh, not wholly new, but many, many, many new faces and younger people with different background formation and education. So it, it's not a solo operation. It, it, it has been initiated but from the top, obviously, but it is being developed with many, many competent people, uh, men and women. Now, finally, finally, uh, to uh, emphasize what Mr. Aripov said, this is something that has to be understood regionally. This is not just some narrow one something happening in one country. And obviously, if that is in fact the case, and we, we feel that that is decisively so, then obviously a Western and a, an American response should also have a regional character. 
uh, and embracing a region which now, thanks to Uzbekistan's own initiative, clearly includes Afghanistan. Final point that I would make, and this is in the, in the, in the form of an address to, to this audience. Reviewing this extremely complicated and multi-sided phenomenon of, of reform in Uzbekistan, uh, of course, it's dizzying. It is inconceivable that every single for, uh, initiative is going to be crowned with success. Life isn't like that. We know that. However, it does, I think, call on us to exercise patience in, in responding. This is, they've entered into something very complex. It's not going to be short term. It's going to take a long time. There will be failures. There will be setbacks. What that requires, I think, from, from us is patience and tenacity. Thank you. Here's the book. Okay. Oh, we've had a chance for everyone on our panel to uh, provide some insight to what's happening. I'd like to now turn to Senator Safaev again. You've been living and observing the U.S.-Uzbek relationship for over uh, literally a generation. So your thoughts on this latest turn, on the President's visit, and where this relationship is going to go? Very good. Thank you. Uh, you know, after the meeting in the White House, the day after tomorrow, the both sides will adopt a joint statement. I don't know, Liz may announce that, or it's a revealing of this big secret. <laughs> <laughs> but this is audience of friends, and I think that we might do that. And the title of this joint statement says for itself. U.S. Uzbekistan, beginning of new strategic partnership. I think there is no need for further comments on that. Um, and today, we have many items on our bilateral agenda. This is security, regional cooperation, economic ties, cultural ties, humanitarian ties, etc. Military to military ties, and I think that it's all having a perspective. What's uh, important for us to know that Uzbekistan has a profound interest in cooperating with the United States in all these fields. We think that presence of United States uh, in the region is very important. We highly appreciate the all endeavors done by United States and the Western coalition in Afghanistan. We should admit that it was a, a crucial factor of keeping peace and stability in whole Central Asia. In his statement uh, during the last conference on Afghanistan last month, President Mirziyoyev stated, to my mind, fundamental point. He said, Afghanistan is different what, uh, if we will compare it to what was Afghanistan before the 9-11. This is a different country with constitution, with the president, with very active parliament, the country where the rights of national minorities are respected, Uzbeks, Tajiks, Belugis, Hazara, even during the glorious, peaceful time of Shah, they never had their own schools, newspapers, media. Afghanistan is a country where the boys and girls can attend the school with a developing healthcare system. There is a huge, tremendous challenge. But nevertheless, we should not undermine and underestimate what's been done by the United States in Afghanistan. And uh, I think that uh, whole Central Asia and Uzbekistan is the first, uh, having a profound interest in further cooperating with the United States in this field. And lastly, just to conclude, uh, one of the primary interests of Uzbekistan is in the economic cooperation with the United States. Two reasons for that. First, it comes from the appreciation of the fact that the United States leading technological country, which might bring uh, brand new technologies and investment to Uzbekistan. Second, and perhaps it's even more important, and it was, by the way, emphasized by President Mirziyoyev, that 
American standard of doing business, clean, transparent, is what we need. If we want to upgrade our business ethic, eradicate corruption in such a spheres like oil and gas, mining, etc., we should deal with American companies. And we are now vigorously trying to uh, make some in incentives for them to come, and uh, we're happy to inform you that there is a growing interest of American big companies to do uh, business in Uzbekistan. My estimation of the figures to be signed a little bit different from your Lisa. <laughs> it, it will be more than uh, mentioned by you for, but let's wait for until tomorrow when uh, under the aegis of AECC the deal will, will, will be signed. Uh, we, time is growing short, but I'd like to give uh, Lisa a chance <laughs> to comment on what we've just heard, and then we'll give the audience a chance to ask questions. Lisa. Well, yeah, I would just say that this is very encouraging uh, to see uh, Uzbekistan's focus on developing its relationship with Afghanistan and, and developing those projects for uh, connectivity. You talked about the railroad uh, from uh, Mazar to Herat. Uh, very important project, and uh, the role that the Tashkent conference played in continuing the Kabul process conference. Um, somebody indicated uh, the support that Uzbekistan has for an Afghan-owned, Afghan-initiated peace process. This is so important uh, to support the Afghan government as it faces uh, these challenges and to uh, put pressure for a peace process. And uh, so I think the, the role that Uzbekistan is playing is, is so important uh, with regard to Afghanistan. And we certainly appreciate uh, the sustainment support um, provided along the Northern Distribution Network. Uh, this has allowed un uninterrupted uh, access to our forces in Afghanistan over the past decade. And we know we can count on Uzbekistan to continue uh, to provide this kind of access, uh, which is so crucial. Thank you very much. Uh, Ariel Cohen, the Atlantic Council, and Ambassador, please call me Ariel. Um, it is great to see this important delegation in Washington. Really something new is happening. But looking at the region, uh, you cannot help by not noticing a big strategic initiative by China, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, you notice Russian... Uh, promotion of uh, Europe, uh, Eurasian Economic Union. How does Uzbekistan going to balance its policy and what is your perception, your sense and your plans vis-a-vis -vis Beijing and Moscow and their interests in the region? I will try to answer uh, Ariel to your question. Perhaps I'm more uh, seasoned diplomat than other <laughs> Uzbek panelists, and that's why I will try to find a uh, nuanced answer to your question. First of all, frankly, I always uh, think um, that two factors are very important to realize. First, you know, we should not, uh, we should stop to think to look to the Central Asia from during the geopolitical analysis and apply the terms of the great game theory. After all, it's a different time. And the Central Asian countries, and Uzbekistan, one of the first among them, are not passive objects of any game. They're subjects, uh, they're, not, uh, they're, uh, they're actors and very act, uh, the proactive actors of the situation. So, uh, by the way, I, I do believe that the relationship between the United States and other countries with Uzbekistan, with any other countries of Central Asia, not necessarily uh, binded to the, let's say, Afghanistan, Russia, China, they have no self-importance. This is first fundamental factor for me in making any analysis in Central Asia. Second. I do believe that, after all, today, perhaps it's naive a little bit, but we should stop to think about uh, applying zero-sum gain principles towards the Central Asia side. Uh, not necessarily if 
one of the country have some more gaining something, another will lose. For instance, let me give you one example. We are go going to sign a big deal with the GE, General Electric. And they are going to produce their equipment to be supplied to Uzbekistan in China. And by the way, using some fund resources allocated by the Chinese government. It's good, good. For Uzbekistan only benefits that. And I think that such a win-win situation might be applied everyone, everywhere. Again, uh, for instance, China is implementing this Silk Road strategy, which means development of uh, the uh, transport corridors connecting uh, Uzbekistan Central Asia with the East and West. Not far than two days ago, I had a lunch with our common friend, Tedo de Parizza, who is the advisor of the Prime Minister of uh, Georgia, Fedor Kirishili. He said, we're looking forward when your railroad will be connected with Chinese. Because in this case, we have a direct way via Uzbekistan to the huge market of China. Who is losing from the development of our cooperation with China in this field? Russia is one of the strategic partners of Uzbekistan. A quarter of our trade is with Russia. There's the historic uh, routes connecting uh, each country. So I think that we should try to find equilibrium of interest and win-win situation everywhere. At least for Uzbekistan, it's not equally distantiating from all the access, but equally cooperating with all the uh, countries involved to the Central Asia. Okay. I'd like to just add to that. Uh, so the U.S. supports independent, sovereign nations of Central Asia. Um, <laughs> we welcome the integration of the Central Asia region. Uh, this meeting, uh, this remarkable meeting held in Astana in mid-March of the heads of state, the first of its kind. We expect uh, many more meetings like this. And, you know, the U.S. Uh, feels the best way to engage with the region is in the C5 plus one format, the five Central Asia states and the U.S., because we believe that an independent, um, integrated region uh, is really in the U.S. interest. And the way that the U.S. invests in countries is, is to encourage their self-reliance, not dependence. We want to see self-reliant, independent uh, countries. Um, and we believe that you know, this is uh, the best thing for U.S. interests in the region. By um, you know, improving regional cooperation, by solving existing problems among Central Asian countries, uh, by uh, deepening uh, trade and economic relations among them, we're really making Central Asia more stable, more safe. And at the end, it's in the interest of all external forces which have interest in Central Asia, especially those which has the borders with the region. Ариэль, вашему вопросу вот такую ремарку. Понимаете, вот афганская проблема. Мы в процессе подготовки побывали и в Пекине, и в Москве, и в Вашингтоне. Это та проблема, где все эти страны могут найти общий единый подход. И мы очень благодарны и нашим китайским друзьям, и российским друзьям, и американским друзьям, которые с самого начала поддержали идею проведения э, Ташкентской конференции. Mm -hmm. uh, и... yeah. Well, um, first of all, let me also make a small remark on my side. Um, while, being, uh, while being prepared for this conference on Afghanistan, we had uh, visited Beijing, Moscow, and Washington. And we had talks uh, with interlocutors in these countries. And uh, we, because all these countries can help in finding a common uh, single approach towards addressing the Afghan problem. And uh, therefore, we are very grateful for our Chinese, Russian, and American friends and colleagues for supporting the idea of having this conference uh, uh, be held in Uzbekistan. И я должен сказать, что центральное есть предложение Организации Объединенных Наций по формату C5 Plus One – это по развитию экономических отношений государств Центральной Азии с Афганистаном. 
на которую наши афганские друзья смотрят, что в будущем это будет C, не C5 plus one, а C6. Это тоже говорит о том, что единое, стабильный, единый стабильный регион, он очень интересен и очень полезен как Соединенным Штатам, как России, так и Китайской Народной Республике. And indeed, uh, within the UN framework, we have um, C5 plus one uh, format of, uh, of meetings, uh, which includes uh, five Central Asian countries plus Afghanistan, uh, based on economic uh, uh, developments and uh, cooperation in particular. And um, in fact, the Afghan colleagues are looking at this format, uh, that in future, this format can become not C5 plus one, but it can turn to C6, and therefore, we believe that uh, the uh, single, stable, and prosperous uh, larger Central Asia region is in the interest, uh, is in the benefit for the United States, for Russia, and for China. И поэтому я просто хочу сказать, что здесь нет столкновения, наверное, интересов, а здесь мы хотим совместить эти интересы и развивать наши стратегические отношения. So, so, to be honest, we don't see um, a clash of interests here. We would like to unite this interest and to channel them to uh, make the Central Asia more prosperous and uh, more stable. Thank you. Uh, next question. Thank you. I'm now Bohori Mambo from the Voice of America, a journalist who just got accreditation in Uzbekistan, so I can't wait to report from my native country. Um, my question is very simple, and it's to Lisa, and it comes from our audience. How much does President Trump know about Uzbekistan and in, in, about Central Asia in general? I mean, I can't tell you how excited and curious they are about this. And what should we really expect from the uh, Wednesday's meeting? <laughs> well, I, c I can assure you, uh, he'll know a lot more about Uzbekistan after Wednesday, uh, but uh, so we, we can be sure of that. And uh, but I think you know this is a, a great opportunity uh, to understand the region and its importance, uh, what it means, you know, for uh, potential U.S. investment and trade linkages with an emerging market, uh, to be able to encourage. Uh, some of the positive movement on reforms that we've already seen, courage, validate those, um, to uh, know about the important role that Uzbekistan is playing with regard to Afghanistan, uh, which uh, you know, President Trump did hold a phone conversation with President Mirziyoyev in December. Uh, they had a very uh, fulsome phone conversation, and he was able to hear uh, firsthand about a lot of these issues. Um, so I think he's looking forward to building on that conversation uh, that he had uh, last December with President Mirziyoyev. Um, uh, and your second part of your question was on the what to expect. Uh, well, I think that um, what we can expect is uh, more interaction between the two countries moving forward. Uh, both in you know the economic sense, uh, but also in terms of um, more security cooperation, uh, more agreements moving forward. Uh, so we're building a, a strong foundation for future uh, cooperation uh, on security and other issues, counterterrorism, which is an increasingly important issue with um, you know uh, the ISIS, the foreign fighters issue, and and the central role. Uh, of Central Asia in, on those uh, topics, and then the increased engagement on Afghanistan and looking uh, for ways that the U.S. can build on that logistical support that it's already receiving um, through Uzbekistan, uh, being able to count on Uzbekistan uh, for that uh, alternate access uh, to Afghanistan. Yeah, I think you can expect to see uh, more discussion and, and more agreements related uh, to all these issues as we you know, embark on a new era of partnership. This uh, is an opportunity to um, sort of revi revive that strategic partnership that we had um, 
you know, earlier in the decade and, and to sort of revive that and infuse that with, with new energy um, based on a lot of the changes that we have seen President Mirziyoyev take over the last 18 months. towards the region and towards Uzbekistan, for which we have to credit President Trump. Uh, okay, question over here, and then here, and then there. Uh, Mohammed Tahir from Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Lisa, my question also goes to you. You referred a couple of times about the uh, role that Uzbekistan is playing in, in the end, uh, Northern Distribution Network. Uh, what exactly they are doing? And also, is there any new development over the past couple of months that we don't know yet? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, well, in terms of the access for the, the supply routes and um, items coming in uh, to Afghanistan for the sustainment uh, of the operation there, um, that's what we're seeing. And I think, you know, we'll have to see what discussions come out of the meeting on Wednesday in terms of if that um, support for that uh, sustainment uh, will expand, uh, and, and if so, in, in what kinds of ways. So I think it's uh, something that, that we'll have to watch for. Uh, thank you, Ruhla Osmani. I'm with Asian Development Bank Washington office and also affiliated with John Hopkins Science in Washington. Uh, thank you very much. I, uh, as someone from uh, that region, Afghanistan, I'm very hopeful and encouraged by the AB Morax and development that I see. Uh, and I look forward to following the new development that comes after the meeting uh, this week. Uh, uh, my uh, question is uh, uh, towards that uh, item about regional cooperation and connectivity, especially investment uh, on infrastructure, connecting. Uh, Uzbekistan uh, to uh, um, uh, Chabahar port, for example, to uh, expand route to author. Uh, I was wondering what uh, uh, the recent developing in the U.S. policy, how much that will impact the connectivity uh, north-south, uh, connecting, for example, Afghanistan to Chabahar and uh, India's uh, connection with uh, Chabahar um, involving Iran. So how much that will impact the regional connectivity? Will this be one of the agenda items to be discussed this week? Thank you. Start. You mentioned many, many times Charbahar. The road is going not only to Charbahar. We are taking uh, the Gwadar and Karachi as well. So, and it's less problematic that you portray, taking into account the current uh, environment here. So uh, the point is the strategic breakthrough to whole Central Asia and Afghanistan. As you know, uh, <coughs> until recently, there weren't any single meter of the railroad in Afghanistan. And only a few years ago, together, Afghanistan and Uzbekistan built up first 67 kilometers um, uh, railroad between Hayraton and mazar sharif Why it's important to Central Asia? To double the landlocked countries of Central Asia, it's the uh, shortest way to the seaports. Gwadar, Karachi, and maybe some like Bandar Abbas and Chorbahar. Uh, now it takes 20, 22 days for the cargoes from Central Asian countries to get first seaport. If the trans Avian transport corridor will be built, it will be two, maybe three days. And I think that for Afghanistan, it's a wonderful opportunity to become a real hub for tra uh, the, the, the trade and uh, regional cooperation. We're happy that Asian Bank has an interest on that. We're looking forward for American administration to support so why it's, uh, let's say, influence and presence in the international financial organization, the funding of this conference. Uzbek experts are ready to come and to start to build this uh, railroad, which will immensely uh, facilitate the development within Afghanistan. Because the road always is enough. It's a transport corridor, not only the railroad. It's a whole infrastructure, uh, including development of cities uh, and uh, the service, etc., etc. 
So we hope that one of the deliverables after this meeting will be, in, on Wednesday, will be clear expression of both sides to go further with the implementing of this strategic and very, very important project. Thank you. Last question over here. Uh, thank you very much for coming. My name is Roxana Gabidulina. I'm a research intern at CSIS. My question has more to do with domestic politics. Um, so we know that sometimes there were problems with implementation where people talked about opening borders, but sometimes the borders were closed. Uh, some people had reported that cotton, what, cotton picking was still going on, forced cotton picking. So I was wondering, um, what are some steps uh, and programs that are taking place within Uzbekistan that are improving the implementation process of President Mirziyoyev's initiatives? Thank you so much. Will you answer that? We're going to take one more question. We'll answer two together. That will Uh, Ralph Winnie with the Eurasia Center. I was wondering if we have a, any perspective on President Mirza Zayev's um, support or opposition to the U.S. moving their embassy um, into Jerusalem. Uh, Uzbekistan has relations with Israel, but at the same time, they're a Muslim country. And certainly this issue has created a lot of instability in the Middle East. I'm wondering if Mirza Zayev would have any perspective you'd like to share with President Trump on that issue, either supportive or uh, op opposing? Uh, however, I, I'm not going to open up a kind of a special ways and means to address this issue in Uzbekistan. They're same everywhere. More role of civil society, more role of the media, more role of parliament and parliament oversight. And I think that all of them together with implementing the good governance system, uh, fighting bureaucracy, inefficiency. This is one of the uh, only ways to address this issue. I think that today uh, the main point for us is make this process irreversible. And uh, it was noted by uh, someone uh, that now new team is coming to the government of Uzbekistan. Trump in many key positions are Western educated, open-minded, people under their 40s. They weigh, they, uh, they think, they act in a completely different way. The parliament is obtaining more and more proactive role, exercising parliamentary control, sometimes strict, sometimes the efficiency must be upgraded. And moreover, I think that what's most important today, that the role of public is growing up. I just, before the coming to this audience, read in Uzbek media that per request of the public, the building up of one of the buildings in the center of Tashkent was stopped. Never before would might imagine that public disagreement, the discussion on the social network impacted the decision-making process of the municipal authorities. I think it's wonderful. And I think that it's the only way how to, we might guarantee the, uh, that it will be, uh, the all laws and decrees will be implemented. But another point which I'd like just to conclude to answering your uh, question is that there is a strong commitment both in government, parliament, and uh, the civil society to make sure that the, all the issues you um, pointed, borders, forced labor will be uh, bring to the logical end. In regard with your question, you're completely right. We have a wonderful relationship with Israel and with the both government, Knesset, and uh, public society. And um, I think that uh, the uh, issues related to the moving of the capital, so fiercely debated everywhere, is all, uh, embassy, embassy to US embassy to, uh, to another country, is that uh, being a subject for fierce debate by many people. It's a little bit already overcrowded, and I think there's no place for Uzbekistan to participate in this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Senator Safaev, uh, Ms. Curtis, our, all of our guests, and thank you all for coming. It was a wonderful event. Thank you.